Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Everyone had their coffee? If I had known there was going to be byright chia pudding, I would have skipped my usual Scottish oatmeal this morning. Seriously, there's some good food over there. If you hadn't tried it, check it out. Cool. So let's actually jump into what we're here to talk about today. So we're all here to talk about observability, which is clearly a topic that we care about. And I think it's really important for us to start out by, as a group, stepping back and thinking a bit about the big picture of how we got here to where we are today in the first place and why we have the problems that we do. Software is eating the world. Objects all around us these days contain software, whether that's our cars, our refrigerators, computers. And the systems that we're building are becoming more and more complex. And not only that, but software is just playing a larger role in our lives. We use software to buy healthcare. We use it to get from place to place. And often, at our day jobs, we're working every day using software to get our actual work done. And yet, there's another trend that has been happening. There, there's been a growing uh, proliferation of software as a service. There aren't enough software developers to go around. As more and more things have become powered with software, we haven't been able to train enough people to be able to build and operate them. Most companies can't hire as many software engineers as they want to. And even if we could hire as many engineers as we could get our hands on, the more people you add to an organization, the more complex communication an organization is within that organization. If you can keep smaller, more focused teams, you can ship faster. You can react more quickly to a changing uh, environment. And your business can be more agile. This means that more and more today, companies are focusing on spe solving specific problems. And we're reaching a state where people are collaborating and integrating not just within software teams within a single organization, but also across teams. And this means that more and more companies today are building platforms that other people can build with and integrate with. At the same time, the complexity of how we build software continues to increase. At its core, the abstractions that we've used to build software, which go all the way back to this binary abstraction, ones and zeros, uh, electricity signals that we interpret into a binary signal, we've made these abstractions so reliable that we've been able to, as humans, as a society, continue to invent new abstractions that continue to make the complexity that we're hiding larger and larger as the years and decades have gone by. A decade or two ago, a typical software architecture might look like this, otherwise known as the LAMP stack. You had uh, some sort of client, maybe on a desktop machine, uh, connecting to a web server, uh, typically Apache back in the day. Then the software, the actual thing that developers at a company would be building, would be some monolithic application written in uh, PHP or Perl or whatever the favorite language at some company was. And then, as Charity mentioned earlier, there'd be a single database in which you would put all of the data storage that you needed for that application, no matter what was happening, uh, kind of from the client. Fast forward to today, and things have gotten a lot more complicated. We have service-oriented architectures, whether that's macro services where a service is doing many different things, or uh, the extreme end at microservices where you have single services that are serving very small purposes, each with their own backing data store, probably owned by a single team uh, at a company. And there's all sorts of crazy buzzword shit. Many services, people are using container, containers in order to deploy their software. 
You have service discovery, because if you have many services, you have to figure out where they are and how do I talk to them. We're treating our servers as cattle, not pets. We're doing things like auto-scaling. So these, th these two things go hand in hand, and that adds a lot of kind of dynamism and changeability to the services that we're operating. Like, I can't say that I have 100 serv servers that I'm responsible for as an operations engineer. You know, maybe at like 6 a.m. it's like 100, and then at 6 p.m. it's 50 because our peak traffic is in the morning. Um, so things are changing, and we're building these systems that can respond to their environments, and this means that they are less stable. We don't know exactly like what the state is of these systems at any, at any given time. We're using uh, service orchestration in order to do things across these massive distributed systems. And all of this is done in the name of high availability. Because we've gotten to a place where we're in a global economy, and an organization might be building something that's being consumed by people in China, Australia, Germany, and Oregon. There's no window that you can just take your service down in order to perform some maintenance. So we've developed all these techniques that allow our service to be operating at all times, to always be available. And this has introduced more complexity into the systems. In spite of all this complexity, we still need to be able to figure out what the hell is going on in our systems. Because they break. There are all sorts of like edge cases and conditions that we didn't predict. And our customers come to us and they're like, hey, this service isn't working as advertised. When I do this thing, this thing happens. Or like, you'll see some trend in some, some monitoring that you have and you won't know what's going on. And that's why we're all here today. Observability. One of the purposes of this event here today is to learn from all of you what you believe is observability, and to form a collective definition. And I'm going to see that a little bit of this by sharing with you what, what I consider to be my definition, that we've seen work well at Nihilus, and like how, kind of how we think about observability at Nihilus. And what it really comes down to is that software is opaque by default. Because software is a black box, we must make software generate data in order to clue us people in on what exactly it is, go it is happening in the software. Today, because software is almost entirely distributed systems, the data is even more important. Observable systems allow people to answer the question, is this thing working properly? And even more important, if it's not working pro properly, observable systems will allow us to diagnose the scope and impact of what is going wrong and identify what is happening if the answer is no, it's not working properly. Which, as you all know, happens a lot when we're dealing with distributed systems and there's all sorts of weird stuff happening behind the scenes. As a last point, I think it's really important that an observable system not only provides the data for you to be able to uh, explore and figure out what's going on when uh, something is going wrong, or you just need to understand the system's behavior, but it also needs to be uh, available in a fast, user-friendly manner. If you have the data available, but the tools that you're using in order to explore that data um, just take too long to operate, or you're not able to kind of ask questions and answer them quickly and then kind of go from there with what you've learned, you're not going to use them properly, and you're not going to get to the point of understanding of what exactly is happening in my system. What, if I tweak this thing here, what, what happens on the other end? Uh, what is this customer seeing? So speed is almost as important as having the data in the first place. At Nihilus, we started out uh, back in 2013, and I'll get 
in just a second to a bit of an overview of what we actually do. But we started out with uh, unstructured logs, uh, traditional monitoring, and time series metrics back in the day to try to figure out what was going on with our software. And I say unstructured logs here um, kind of uh, a little bit hypothetically um, because that didn't actually last very long. Right when we were getting started at Nihilus, people were starting to figure out that you needed to structure your logs. So it was within the first year or so of uh, the company that we transitioned all of our application software to uh, output structured logs. So in some sense, I actually don't remember a world where I tried to solve some significant problem using unstructured logs. So if you want some terrible war stories about that, uh, I'm sure there are some older folks in the room. <laughs> Charity can give suggestions. But starting out with just these things uh, sort of worked. But eventually it became not enough. And I'm going to talk a little bit more, that, more about that in just a minute. First, let's talk a little bit about giving you some context about what exactly uh, my company does and what problems we've been trying to solve. So. Nihilus is a platform, uh, just like I was talking about earlier. There's more and more companies that are building platforms that help other people do things. And the problem that Nihilus has been trying to solve is the fact that uh, email is pretty much the lingua franca of business. Whenever you're trying to uh, communicate between organizations for some sort of business purpose, chances are you're going to be sending some emails, whether that's documents, uh, having conversations, doing cold outreach to people. Um, and the problem is that, along with software in general, over the past four decades, the complexity of developing with email has also really increased. So what do we as humans do when faced with uh, increasing complexity? Well, the technique that we've developed is to create abstractions to hide that complexity and better tools to help people uh, be able to just continue to build things despite the fact that there is complexity under the hood. So the Nihilus platform is basically a unified REST API that abstracts away 40 years of uh, email protocol history and gives you a single integration that you can plug into any application and get access to people's email mailboxes, their calendars, and their contacts. At Nihilus, because we're a platform, there are several different stakeholders that need observability into what's happening with our software. First and foremost, that's our software engineers who are building and operating our software. But we also have a front-facing customer support team. And because our product is something that other organizations are expected to build with and integrate with, customer support are the first people who see the problems that our customers are having. And they need good tools to help those customers understand what's going on and to drive whatever issue it is towards resolution. Thirdly, our customers also need uh, observability into our software. As a platform provider, it's key for us to make it feel to developers that are using our platform that uh, we are empowering them by making it easier, not uh, being a black box that they can't see what's going on. Because it can be very tempting to just decide to solve a problem by building everything yourself because you have all of that control and insight. Um, so we need to kind of like meet that need by providing people with insight into what's happening in our software. Because our customers are developers too. Here's a little bit, uh, a little diagram of what our back end looks like. Um, I would call this basically like a macro services architecture. We don't do much with microservices or like super tiny kind of container orchestration, but we do have a fair amount of complexity on our back end. Uh, just because of all the things that we're trying to do. Uh, one is that we're working with a ton of data. So people have a lot of email. And that meant that one of the, the kind of quickest problems that we had to solve was like, how do we store all this data and kind of deal with the volume? So our primary data store is a sharded, horizontally sharded by mailbox MySQL data store. <laughs> 
Then we have a whole bunch of different kind of macro services that talk to that data store. Um, there's like a single service that serves our API. There's a single service that serves our developer dashboard. Uh, we have like a webhook service and a few other internal ones. There's a lot of shared code between these services. Um, and they do also talk to the same data stores. So it's not really a microservices data store uh, or architecture where we have different data stores for different services. Uh, it's a little bit simpler than that. But there's also a fair amount of complexity in that we have, um, Essentially, because we're abstracting over all this history, uh, users can connect mailboxes to our platform. And what we do then is we start syncing all the data in those mailboxes uh, kind of on an ongoing base basis in the background to keep our data store up to date so we can serve our API. It's essentially you can think of it as like sync as a service with some extra analytics capabilities built in on top. So, one of the interesting distributed systems that we have on our back end is that you know, when you connect a new mailbox to our platform, uh, it drops uh, a message into a queue that uh, has another service that's listening to it, which is essentially like a pool of servers um, that will uh, claim mailboxes to sync on their processes. Um, so when there's a new account drops into this queue, we have uh, machines with uh, available capacity listening to that queue. And one of them will pop it off and claim it and start syncing it. So there's already, in, the, in just that one system, there's like three different services that are all interacting. And we have to understand what's happening between all of those. And even things like how load affects um, what kind of capacity we have for syncing additional uh, mailboxes. So some really fun stuff, some, some pretty cool distributed pro systems problems here, despite the fact that we're not kind of going all out on microservices. All right, so how do we figure out what exactly this is happening in our backend systems? Well, as I mentioned before, for observability, your software needs to generate data. So our software generates uh, a bunch of different types of data depending on what kind of visibility insight we're, supposed, we're trying to get. We do generate traditional time series metrics for some things. For example, we track all like system stats in time series metrics, things like CPU, memory usage, that kind of stuff. Um, and anything that's like basically a single kind of continuous variable that needs to be tracked over time. Um, so that's a subset of what we generate. Um, we also generate structured logs and events, which is probably the biggest and most interesting piece of data that uh, we generate. And I'm going to dive into a bunch of examples of what we do with structured events later. Uh, and then we also generate stack traces and exceptions, which we aggregate uh, in using a typical kind of stack trace aggregator so we can figure out kind of what in what ways our software is blowing up, when you do deploys, um, what new kind of failure cases are we introducing. And then we use different tools to explore this data. And I'll go a lot into kind of the nitty gritty of this in just a minute. To get things started with the concrete examples, one of the most important things that we do for getting insight into um, kind of the behavior of different customers on our API platform is making sure that we uh, tag API requests that we're serving with all the different kinds of context that we might need in order to figure out what's going on later. Um, I can't take credit for this idea. Uh, credit for this goes to Ben Hartshorn in the back somewhere over there. Um, we were chatting like a couple years ago, and he was like, you know, I think it would be really cool if you could just like aggregate all of the context you needed onto the API request and like flush that all out in the same log line. So we took that idea, we did it, and it worked great. So thanks, Ben. Um, and the way that we do it is essentially, so we're a Python shop, and uh, we run our API servers uh, using this uh, WSGI server called Gunicorn. And so we have a custom WSGI handler that implements this logging that we plug in on top of the basic one that uh, logs all of this context out as soon as we finish serving a request. 
And so this is like the custom WSDI handler, and then in individual API requests, we use uh, this Python API library called Flask, and this uses request globals. And so on the request global, we're able to set uh, a variable called log context that we essentially can save any piece of context on that API request that we might want to use later for kind of exploring the data. So a couple examples here uh, are like which application on our platform made that API request, um, which mailbox it was associated with. Um, when it comes to errors, we also um, attach any exception info to a 500 that we serve. So one of the cool things that comes out of that is actually that we essentially have a, there we go. Uh, we, our engineers can at any point in basically real time see a dashboard of like what API requests are failing, what exceptions are generating those uh, failures, what customer is seeing those failures, what mailbox they uh, apply to, what like API host name is happening, what database shard they're on, all these different dimensions that might be uh, relevant for figuring out what's going on. This is a super fun dashboard. I always like looking at it, especially when people are fixing things on it. All right, so let's dive into another example uh, that involves using this data. So a few weeks ago, uh, a big customer of ours came to us, and uh, they sent in a support ticket, and they're like, uh, hey, what's going on with your service? We're seeing like super high latency. Uh, you guys don't have a status page incident up. Is there some sort of service issue that's going on on your end? And they sent us this graph that was basically, I don't know, it's like New Relic or something like that, and uh, showing kind of their internal metrics on like, how long it was taking for us to service their API requests. So as a platform, when responding to this kind of support request, we need to be able to go to our systems and look at them from the point of view of this customer that is asking us what's going on. Because like our, our alerting wasn't going off, um, and yet they were having a problem. So one of the most important tools we use is uh, actually a honeycomb. Um, but I think the most important thing about honeycomb is that it, allow it allows you to basically explore the data that you have, that you're generating, in a very fast and efficient manner. So it's generally like the first place that we go when we're trying to figure out like what is the general pattern that is going on? What does this situation look like from the point of view of a specific customer? Um, and just kind of like trends or like finding specific instances of a problem happening. Um, so in this case, uh, we went ahead and pulled up the uh, honeycomb filters for this specific customer. And we're like, OK, so what actually are they seeing? And uh, we did a couple calculations on the data to try to find out what requests were taking a long time that were blowing out their numbers. Because they sent us an aggregate. Um, but that wasn't really enough for us to like, figure out what was going on. So we started breaking down the data in order to dive more into what was actually happening. So what we saw here is that right around when they were reporting that their latency numbers were really high, we were seeing these spikes periodically uh, every 20 minutes uh, for a specific endpoints, this like, message lookup endpoint. Um, and that was almost certainly, as soon as you like, break this down by endpoint, filtering on that customer, you can see that there's something weird going on right at that time. So Honeycomb makes it really easy for you to um, just kind of like narrow in on that one endpoint that was having a problem. So you can filter by any field. So we're like, OK, this is the data that we care about. Let's ignore everything else. Um, so we zoomed in on this one endpoint. And then we started doing things like breaking down by what is the HTTP status that we're sending them, um, what mailboxes are being affected. 
Um, because from this pattern, you as an engineer can have like some hunches about what's going on. It's like, oh, it's happening every 20 minutes. That seems like some sort of like retry interval. Um, also, there's like thousands of requests every 20 minutes. That's weird. That seems like some sort of like mm, kind of bad, I don't know, system effect retry situation that's happening. Um, so is that like all for the same mailbox? Is it like every single one of their accounts that's retrying? Like we need to have the information on our end to be able to help our customers figure out what's going on because um, you know, they, don't, they don't always realize what's going on in their systems either. So we need to work together in order to kind of help them towards resolution. So broke things down by a few more different uh, pieces of data that we tag our API requests with. And you can see pretty clearly from this graph that there's uh, a couple specific mailboxes. So there's this like account ID field, which is essentially like our I internal ID for each specific mailbox. And you can see that there are a couple ones that are just like doing thousands of retries on this one request um, every uh, every 20 minutes. And uh, it turned out what was happening was one our rate limiting was like failing to properly rate limit this. So we identified a shortcoming in our rate limiting where we weren't rate limiting these bursts. Um, and two, kind of the root cause for why they were failing in the first place was that uh, these specific requests were basically like fetching a bunch of raw data that was kind of old that we weren't caching. So we are proxying these requests back to uh, an on-prem exchange server. And when we sent like hundreds of requests at the same time to this Exchange server, they just all timed out. And we were for forwarding those timeouts back to the customer. So this was causing some pernicious system effects on their end, where their system was freaking out because there are all these timeouts. So we were able to work around it for them by temporarily disabling these mailboxes and then working with them to figure out the retry situation and re-enable these, uh, these users uh, as soon as we are able to fix that situation. So that's kind of like an end-to-end -end scenario where like a customer came to us and uh, we were like, okay, we need to figure out what's going on. We need to look at this data through the eyes of the customer and we need to be able to break it down by um, essentially like different units. And by kind of iteratively asking questions, we could see patterns and figure out what was going on. <coughs> The next example I wanted to share uh, was uh, an internal situation related to an outage that we were having. So essentially, one day, a while back, we mm, had a MySQL ma uh, primary database uh, fail. And the automatic failover didn't work at that time. So our DBAs got paged, they got in line, they manually did finish the failover and recovered the replica, and everything was looking good. They're like, okay, kind of those uh, API requests that we were dropping because this cluster was down um, are back to normal again. But there was something weird that kept happening after that. We we kept dropping a, a tiny fraction of uh, continued API requests, even though the failover had. Um, completed, and we're like, everything should be fine now. So it just so happened that we, this coincided with our regular call with our, our DBAs. So um, we were on the phone with them, and we were actually like browsing through the production data that we had. Um, and we could see that there was a small number of requests that were failing. Uh, they were timing out at our database proxy, which usually means that, that like, uh, the cluster is down or um, something is happening where the, the proxy doesn't know how to communicate with whatever shard it's trying to talk to. Um, and so we were browsing through this data kind of on a screen share and uh, eventually uh, our lead DBA was like, what happens if you group this by host name, by like host name of the server that's making the request? And so we did that. And it looked like this. So this is grouping my host name and the error message. Uh, it would be a little clearer if we only grouped my host name, but uh, you can see that all of the host names here are the same host name. So 
pretty much as soon as we like did that one query, um, he was like, oh, I know what's going on. It turned out that uh, they had been testing uh, a new version of our database proxy on this one particular machine. And like throughout the kind of operations that had been happening to recover the, the primary that had failed, um, the configuration on that, um, that one uh, experimental kind of upgraded proxy was not correct. And therefore, the requests that were going through it were not working. And by being able to kind of break down by all these different fields and just kind of experiment and try different things, we were able to identify, oh, oh yeah, I remember that. That thing's been running there for a week because we were testing a new version. Um, and very quickly fixed the problem. Um, another example I wanted to share with of like how we solve problems with uh, kind of observable data is related to long-running database sessions. So for better or for worse, our code base heavily uses database transactions. Um, the reason that we, that we do that is actually because the ORM that we chose, this library called SQL Alchemy, uses transactions by default. So we never really consciously made the decision to use transactions everywhere. Uh, it just happened for us back in the early days when we were building things. And you know, we didn't have a kind of scale that it actually really mattered. Um, but for better or for worse, these days, now we have to deal with the consequences of using transactions everywhere. Um, and uh, if you're familiar with uh, how relational databases work, um, you know, they try to maintain isolation between transactions. And that means that the way that you're supposed to use a transaction is you open a transaction, you do thing like x, y, and z, and then you commit that transaction, and it's done and gone. It's bad if you do this. Open a transaction, do one thing, wait for five minutes, do another thing, and then eventually commit for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one, your database has to hold open various different locks in order to maintain this transaction isolation. Um, and two, you're just, your application process is like hogging this database connection for that entire time. Um, so it's bad for performance, which can cause outages. Uh, it's bad for uh, kind of good use of the number of connections that you have available to a given database. Um, every database connection that you make from an application to your database has some memory overhead on the database side for, for the database to keep track of that connection and everything that's going on with it. Um, so if you reach your database max connections, that, um, that can cause an outage as well. Uh, that's a like, system degradation. And because we have essentially like hundreds of different hosts and like thousands of different processes that all have their own connection pooling mechanisms that are all checking out database connections and using them for various different things. Um, we found it very difficult to, to track down the source of these long running transactions. And so we've actually run into this problem several times over the years and we've tried a couple different ways of, um, of solving it. Everything from, oh, we've done all sorts of crazy things. Uh, at one point, we um, had like a local HTTP server on every like sync host and sync process that if you curled it, it would dump you the data about like all of the connection pool usage. Um, we also at one point had an implementation where um, we would create a metric for pool checkout for every connection pool. Um, which is a lot of connection pools. And if you ever run a Graphite server, you'll uh, remember that when you create a whole bunch of new metrics in Graphite, it actually like rate limits the rate at which you can create new metrics so that you don't like use up all the inodes on your server or whatever, um, because each metric is essentially just a file. Um, and it's also not really a good use for traditional metrics because like you don't really care about, I guess there's more information that you need to solve this problem than just like, I checked out the connection and then I put it back. 
there's more context that you need around like who's doing the checking out, how long it held the database connection for. And it's really expensive cognitively to save like different types of data in like different systems and then have to like put them all together yourself. So in our latest implementation of how do we figure out wh where this problem is happening and, and how to fix it, um, is using a data visualization uh, called a heat map, where essentially, like, so we on our back end, we, um, we essentially use coroutine concurrency because we're doing a ton of I.O., so it makes sense to kind of use a technique for, for concurrency that is optimized for uh, kind of I.O. bound systems. So uh, we use this coroutine library for Python called gevent, and what we ended up doing was building a uh, coroutine in this library that essentially its job is to kind of like monitor uh, database connections that are checked out and uh, periodically emit an event that's like, hey, this database session has been live for like this amount of time. It comes from this spot. So we can feed that into a heat map visualization with the data with all this context where we visualize the, the time that this database session has been alive and kind of color in a different color the ones that have been alive for a really long time. So you can see in this graph that there's like this like long streak of like kind of orange and red, which turned out to be a bunch of uh, places in our uh, calendar syncing code where we were just like, you know, checking out a database connection, doing like a ton of work, uh, and then like committing it a while later. Uh, maybe like even making some calls to like the, the back end calendar provider in the meantime, which was like totally monopolizing these database connections. <coughs> and by building this custom instrumentation that emitted events with all of the relevant contexts, we were able to solve the immediate problem and also set us up for being able to kind of go in periodically and see if you're reintroducing this problem in the future. Uh, another thing that we have built on our end in order to kind of increase our uh, ability to see what is happening on our backend systems is uh, the system for uh, kind of generating events when account sync states changes. So I mentioned previously that we have a fleet of a couple hundred machines that essentially are persistently keeping our data store up to date with um, kind of all of the changes that are happening on a mail provider so that we can serve them in our API. Um, we also have built this system that kind of keeps track of like whether or not those accounts are up to date, whether they're syncing properly, whether they have an error, uh, whether they, their credentials are now invalid and someone needs to reconnect to re-auth that mailbox. And one of the things that we have run into problems with is like how do you tell, like if someone reports that like, oh, this account isn't syncing properly, like how do you know, and it's, and your customer support uh, person pulls up your kind of internal dashboard and is like, well, it says it's syncing properly now. How do you kind of like look back into the past and see like, hey, wh what was the state of this account like six hours ago or like yesterday? So we built this system that essentially emits events when an account changes state, or not even just when it changes state, but it's kind of a periodically, per will periodically emit events that gives the current state of an account. Uh, and here's an example of that. This isn't like the super most interesting example, but uh, kind of gives you a picture of the kind of data that I'm talking about. Where, like, as you can see in this, uh, this graph, that this particular mailbox, for a while it was syncing properly. Um, we would kind of check in, be like totally up to date. And then at some point, uh, I don't know, either the user like revoked their OAuth token for us or like if they were using some sort of password-based server, they changed their password and the account stopped working properly because it transitioned to the invalid state. So that gives us some insight into kind of historical state changes on uh, these uh, mailboxes that are syncing on our system. 
Uh, another example that I wanted to share with you is a performance-related example where um, because we're essentially like offering sync as a service, we not only care that the data is getting into our system, but we also care that it's getting into our system in a timely manner. So some customers uh, at some point were reporting that, oh, hey, I connected this new mailbox, and then I was like, you know, curling your messages API, and there was no data that was showing in this API for like a few minutes. Is that supposed to be happening? And we're like, nope, <laughs> not supposed to be happening. Um, then it was our job to figure out what was happening, how widespread is this, who is it affecting, how bad is it? Um, because with a single report from a customer, we don't actually know the answer to any of those questions. We just know that they noticed something that was weird that we didn't think should be happening. So in this particular case, um, we used a couple of different tools in conjunction in order to figure out what was going on. So <clears throat> what we did was, uh, can you see an example of this here? Step one find the needles in the haystack. So the first step is always to kind of like see, find examples of something that's happening unless someone's like reported a specific instance. So in this particular data set, you can see that we're generating event data that tags uh, basically what we're calling the time to first message for each mailbox. So every time we sync the first message for a mailbox, we generate an event and we tag that with all sorts of different things, like, uh, like what mail provider it's on, what machine it's syncing on, uh, and various other different fields. And you can see just kind of on, in the basic trend here that it's pretty easy to kind of slap a filter on this and say, OK, show me every mailbox that has been connected in the last couple of days that took more than five minutes to sync their first message. Because those are really easy examples of like, stuff that shouldn't be happening. And then what we did was we kind of dove individually into different mailboxes that were having this problem. And sometimes we've had to kind of look at various different cases because you don't necessarily know if the same problem will be affecting everyone. It could be multiple different things that are happening. Um, and the second step that we do is we dive in and look more in detail about what exactly is happening for that one particular instance. <clears throat> so in this case, because our sync machines are essentially like persistently syncing uh, an account over time, th the next step to like get more detail is to look at our kind of debug logging for that process. So you can see in the screenshot of the logs that uh, the account was created uh, at about 2 p.m. and then uh, the sync wasn't started, actually, until two minutes later. And we immediately were like, well, that's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to drop in the queue, get claimed, and, and start syncing within seconds. So at that point, it was time to, to consult various other pieces of data that we were collecting as well to figure out what was happening. One was uh, the logs for the other pieces of the system that dealt with kind of uh, distributing accounts. So there is this one service that uh, kind of like put things into this queue. Um, and we also need to look at things like uh, kind of system metrics. So like the CPU uh, that was being used on the sync fleet at the time. Um, we actually had to add some new instrumentation to get a sense as to like what, how like load might be affecting the capacity for the sync fleet. Um, how many slots were available uh, on the kind of existing sync fleet. And eventually we were able to track this to uh, kind of funny distributed systems problem where um, the way that we had implemented kind of uh, listening to this queue that, um, that, that distributed new accounts for syncing on the sync fleet was that each individual uh, process on the sync fleet would use a Redis pub sub connection to listen to this queue that was, that was um, served via Redis. And unfortunately, the way that kind of like the sync loop was architected, um, the individual processes wouldn't check their local load until 
they had an account that was ready to sync. So it was possible for an account to essentially be claimed by a sync machine, and then that process would get to its load check and would say, oh, hey, I don't have any capacity on this machine. Put it back in the queue. And so an account could actually keep bouncing between many different sync machines for like essentially an indefinite amount of time if it got unlucky. Um, so with this information, we were able to kind of go back to like our uh, kind of architecture, uh, figure out a way to treat to tweak the distributed system to not do that. So in this case, we're like, wow, this is a really bad systems effect where like, you can just like, kind of bounce around indefinitely. We need to kind of re-architect this loop to make sure that like, if uh, a sync process doesn't have the capacity to be syncing a new account, then it shouldn't even be listening to this queue. So I think this is a good example of like, hey, we're building these distributed systems. They have all these like, weird second order and third order effects that we need to be able to understand what is happening and essentially like leave ourselves all of these kind of breadcrumbs such that we can figure out what is happening and be able to modify it and fix it. I wanted to point out at this time that this step of like kind of finding uh, examples of a problem and then kind of moving to examine specific instances of the problem in more detail can have different forms depending on like what kind of problem you're examining. If instead of having this like kind of API that also had this kind of background service that's doing persistent things, we instead had uh, API requests that are being serviced with uh, like a, a services architecture that had more steps to it. The second step might instead be to actually like use like a tracing tool to kind of visualize like the steps that um, the API request is going through, how long they're taking, uh, and where where it might be going wrong when uh, that request is failing. So these steps are kind of generic, but the specific form that they take, uh, I, I think, depends on like what kind of problem you're trying to solve. So which tools are relevant depends on like the exact specifics of the context. I have some thoughts at this point from a few years of experience about why just being able to search through logs or use time series metrics uh, or use like traditional monitoring and alerting haven't been enough for us to kind of be able to understand what's going on in our software systems. And one, one of the primary reasons that uh, we can't use log search just for everything is that being able to iteratively ask questions using a log search system is typically too slow. You have these like gigantic indexes. Uh, it's really good at like searching for random strings, but it's hard to like kind of group by certain fields, add like filters, and if it takes like six seconds for the response to my question to come back, I'm not going to go through a step that involves like 15 different questions because I'm going to like get bored before then. So it's much harder to find the needles in the haystack if you're just kind of like string searching through your logs. Um, another thing that's hard to do is zooming in on individual customers uh, if you're just using metrics because you have to kind of like think of all the things that you might want to break down upon beforehand and then like that's like a shit ton of metrics and like if you're also trying to like feed that into kind of pre-baked dashboards, if you have like mm, thousands of different values for uh, a metric that you're generating dynamically, sometimes the tools that are making these dashboards actually can't handle that. Like you try to like sum across like 5,000 different metrics and like your query suddenly starts timing out. So we've run into some shortcomings with metrics uh, in that they just like can't deal with it if you're like trying to split it up into too many different things. Uh, and another problem that uh, is very relevant is that as you scale up, the amount of kind of like log data that you're generating, if that's like the primary way that, that you're um, kind of saving data, uh, the volume balloons really, really fast. Like you can be generating as much log data for a system, 
um, as like the actual data that you're serving for your customers. And that's a very real problem that um, is tough to solve. And like, you know, eventually we need to like throw out the data and like how we do that um, <coughs> makes a big difference on like what kind of insight we're able to get from our systems. I also wanted to point out that uh, the tools that we're using are very complementary. Um, there's no one thing that we use to solve all of our problems. And um, I, I'm not really convinced that that's ever going to be the case because, like, you know, as engineers, we want to build things that are, like, good at, at, like, certain kinds of things. And, like, a tool that is the kitchen sink might not be good at anything. So we use metrics and alerting to proactively learn about predictable issues or things that we've seen before end-to-end -end kind of things. We use data exploration tools, uh, like Honeycomb, to find potential sources uh, or examples of a problem first, or to also visualize patterns and trends on demand. And then, as a second step, we jump to tracing or log reading to get details about specific issues and kind of dive into the like, nitty-gritty of what's going on. And another thing that we actually end up doing uh, a fair amount is that because we're essentially providing like a sync as a service, and sync is this like really horrible, awful thing that involves like a lot of state and data state. Uh, sometimes we even have to like go spelunking into our database as like a, a final step or a second to final step just to like see like what what did we sync? What does it look like? And like compare that to like what we expected to happen because you know this sync state that we're serving up is like a huge amount of like the product and the value that we're serving. So it's not just like what happens on the way into the database, but it's also like what ends up there because we're probably not recording all of that uh, on the way in. All right. So we haven't solved all the problems yet. There's still a bunch of things that we're dealing with. Um, one thing that's been on my mind is like, what happens when your scale gets to be so big that it's no longer cost effective to save these kind of detailed in-order logs to d dive into individual problems? I don't know, maybe we'll just continue to make more and more money so we can just spend more money on logs. Uh, or maybe we're going to have to figure out what to do about that. Um, so that's a problem that, that is on my mind. Uh, another thing is basically just what I was talking about before, having better tools for exploring synced data in our database because like, that's a part of observability for us. Um, like, what is the system doing? What is the data that ends up there? Um, right now, we kind of have like, mm -hmm, like a series of things where, like, you know, we have this internal admin dashboard which displays a bunch of information from our database about uh, all of the mailboxes that are syncing, and they provide links to like kind of the debug logs for that account. Um, but if there's something that's like not there, you essentially have to like pull up a command line to the production database using like our command line wrapper and like just pull up objects and kind of look at them. And I think this is like often really slow and like painstaking and like a lot of our customer support time ends up going into like just figuring out what, what happened with this particular object. Is this data right in the database? And there's like a lot of room for improvement on improving our speed at figuring out what's going on with the data in the database by having better tools for that. And then another thing that I think could be a lot better for us is that I think one thing that came up earlier when I was talking about some specific problems, for example, figuring out what was happening with this like time to first message data. In order to debug that problem, you essentially need to know in pretty detailed uh, way, what are all of the things that happen after you connect an account? And like, what are all the services that might be involved? Like, you might need to combine logs from various different services in order to kind of trace something through a system. And like, 
Everyone has docs about their system architecture, and they're always out of date. And you probably need to go find someone who worked on the system in order to actually figure out how it actually works right now. And uh, I just believe that there are ways that we could improve um, how we like share this information and kind of dis discover it um, for new people who join the team that will make it easier to kind of dive into these problems as they occur. To wrap things up, I wanted to leave you all with uh, a couple questions uh, to kind of inform the discussions throughout the day. So the first one is just, what have your experiences with observability been in uh, your organization, in the problems that you've been working on to solve? Um, when have you like, not had data that you needed? Uh, what are the right kinds of, of tools and data types for being able to figure out what your system does? Where could it be improved? What data do you not have? When, is, when are your tools too slow to be able to answer the questions and achieve actual understanding of the system and what is happening? And finally, who else needs observability at your organization who is not an engineer? As software is eating the world, more and more people who are not engineers need to understand what it's doing and to be able to kind of be intimate with it. And observability is one way that other people can kind of understand what is happening and get a picture for what all these software systems are doing. Thanks so much for coming here, and I hope to say hi to you all throughout the day.